Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And today I'm going to ask a question. And um, the question is based on a paper that I'm going to review a little bit of with you. What is the most likely way in which you're going to die? We're all going to die. If you're an American citizen, if you're a citizen of a first world or a second world country, what is the most likely cause of your death? And overwhelmingly, it's a heart attack or a stroke. So to understand your cardiovascular risk and to be able to understand what you need to do to mitigate that is going to radically reduce the likelihood you're going to die of a heart attack or a stroke. So this is based on a paper which is a brilliant paper. It's a really, really good paper. It's actually published in the... Uh, and, and look in the show notes, you'll see the reference. But this paper is published in the Journal of the American Cardi College of Cardiology. So the cardiologists, the lipid heart people. And the paper is written by a group out of Denmark, which is a first-class country, really, really good science, typically. Now, not, it can be variable, but I, the Danes do really good research. And um, uh, the, the title of the paper is 10-Year Cardiovascular Risk in Patients with Newly Diagnosed Type 2 Diabetes. So they looked at... Um, two cohorts. They looked at two populations. They looked at a population of patients. They took a population of patients who have just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, which is an A1C of 6.5. Now, normal is 5.2. So they, they didn't even consider the overwhelming majority of people that have an A1C somewhere between 5.2 and 6.5, which is diabetogenic, but not diabetic. They only took the worst of the worst. Those that have crossed that threshold of 6.5 that I agree are most prone to cardiovascular risk. And they then compared them to a separate population, which was all those below 6.5. So they looked at those with a new diagnosis of 6.5 versus those that, were, that did not have 6.5 at the beginning. Some of those may have crossed over and uh, developed diabetes. Some of them may have had an A1C of 6.4 or they may have had an A1C of 4.9. So the general population is not healthy, but they divided those two. So a moderately healthy group versus a clearly defined group with type 2 diabetes. And they looked at a population study over a 10-year course. And they looked, they divided them to male and female, which for the most part you can do. And then they looked at three criteria. And these are three major, big-ass criteria. The risk of a heart attack, the risk of a stroke, very definable endpoints, and the risk of death from a heart attack or a stroke. So death, heart, cardiovascular death, heart attack, stroke. Those are serious endpoints, okay? I love the study. And they looked at the comparison between the two. So a population that we believe is at high risk, at least the hypothesis, has a high risk for for cardiovascular disease, another population who should have a lower risk, but not zero. And they tracked them for 10 years, and they did this uh, study between 2006 and 2013, and they looked at 140,000 people, so it's a big study. And they looked at uh, the group, that 142,000, that developed a new diagnosis of diabetes, which in and of itself is astounding that that number of people over a 10-year period in a small country like Denmark developed a new diagnosis of diabetes. They then looked at a sex and an age match from the general population, in other words, the A1C below 6.5. So these were matched cohorts for age and sex. And the general population, they looked at a, a group of people with 388,000 people. So they're looking at a study of about half a million people in Denmark. And all of these people, here's, this is very important. I, I really like the way they did the study. All of these people did not, did not have atherosclerotic, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. In other words, this group of people had pristine blood vessels going into the study. So their diabetes, their hyperinsulinemia, their insulin resistance had not yet caused cardiovascular risk. And they then looked at the 10-year myocardial infarction, stroke, and fatal cardiovascular risk um, uh, disease. Now... Um, here's another astounding, so they've got a population of 500,000 people. And over the 10-year period, these are people with naive blood vessels, clean blood vessels. 
Over the period of uh, 10 years, there were 52,000, 50,000 significant cardiovascular risk events. In other words, of that 500,000 population, 50,000 had a heart attack, a stroke, or died of a heart attack or stroke. That means that 10% of people over the course of 10 years developed not only cardiovascular disease, but cardiovascular disease with an endpoint irreversible harmful event. That's nuts. Now, they compared the two groups. Compared with the general population, the 10-year risk of developing cardiovascular uh, uh, um, event cardiovascular disease, not just cardiovascular disease, but cardiovascular disease associated with a significant event, a heart attack, a stroke, or dying, that risk was higher, significantly higher in type 2 diabetes patients of both sexes across all age groups. So this didn't just happen in people in their 70s and 80s. This happened in people under the age of 40 as much as it happened in people over the age of 80. So anybody at any age with a new diagnosis of diabetes had a statistically significantly greater risk of developing cardiovascular disease. So, for example, patients aged between 40 to 49 years of age, young people, not even 50, had the largest 10-year cardiovascular risk difference if they had type 2 diabetes versus if they didn't. So, if you're between the ages of 40 and 49, and you have a new, develop, a new diagnosis of diabetes, and you don't have uh, um, cardiovascular disease over the next 10 years, so... By the time you're between 50 and 60, you start out between 40 and 50, by the time you're 50 to 60, as you age, 10 years, 6.1% of people with a diagnosis of diabetes had a significant cardiovascular event. If you're below 6.5, still maybe insulin resistant, that percentage was 3.3%, so less than half. And um, the difference was 2.8%, with a significant hazard ratio. So just the diagnosis of diabetes increases, doubles your risk of a heart attack or a stroke or dying of a heart attack or stroke. That's the first thing. The second incredible thing they looked at is they said, okay, let's take a risk point of 5%. So where does 5% in either group have a heart attack or a stroke? What's that age point? Male and female. And they looked at the diabetics and the general population. And the risk over 10 years of developing a heart attack, uh, where 5% of that population developed a heart attack or a stroke, the average age in men with diabetes, take a guess what it was, average age of men with diabetes having a heart attack or stroke or dying of a heart attack or a stroke. How, how old do you think that is? Average age of death, heart attack or stroke, 43 43, if you had diabetes, a new diagnosis of diabetes, not diabetes from when you were a teenager. So you can extrapolate that. And you compare that with a group of men that had an A1C below 6.5, not a diagnosis of diabetes. That occurred, that 5% threshold occurred 12 years later, 40, 55. So just by not having diabetes, you reduce your risk of a cardiovascular event typically by 12 years before it actually happens. In women, the average age was a little bit later because menopausal affects that. So in women, the 5% five, 5 risk was reached at 51, 51 years of age with type 2 diabetes and 61 without diabetes. Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers. I'm the carb addiction doc and I personally am obesogenic. In other words, if I walk past the donut, I'm gonna gain five pounds. Weight gain is the way my body protects me from sugar. So one of the things I've changed apart from being on a ketogenic diet, because I hate to use this word, but calories are an issue, I like to suppress or reduce caloric consumption. And as such, I have created Mondays as no calorie Mondays. But as you know, you never wanna white knuckle your way through a fast, to a 48 hour fast. So there are times when it's easy and it's straightforward. There are times when I'm really dragging, particularly if I'm not in ketosis where I'm exhausted. That's when I'll use a ketone IQ. 
ketone IQ, Cheryl and myself have found is the best formula to rapidly promote a ketogenic bloodstream. We have got ketones in my blood work, not a big spike, but a gradual rise that lasts about five hours. And I may use this in the morning of that fasting, although I'll often use my coffee, but the time I most struggle is in the evening. When I'm about to have dinner, but I don't want to have dinner, and I'll hit one of these guys, it'll help me to cross to the next day. If I'm in ketosis the next day, I'm good to go. May use one again the next morning, but I strongly, strongly support ketone IQ to help you through your fasting. Even if you're trying to go from two mad to OMAD, two meals a day to one meal a day, and you're struggling at lunchtime, pop one of these babies in, <laughs> make sure you chase it with some coffee or some tea, but it'll help you to transition that time we ordinarily would eat. So 5% of women at the age of 51 are gonna have a heart attack and stroke or die of that. If you don't have diabetes, that 5% ratio has reached at 61. And you'll see on, on, uh, uh, on the screen, you'll see this graph here. It's a really cool graph. And you can see the age difference here. I would urge you to look at this or even just go to PubMed and Google this paper and you will see those results. So what they conclude is that newly, di newly diagnosed, not even long-standing, at worst with long-standing, newly diagnosed diabetes increases 10-year cardiovascular risk across both sexes and all age groups, especially, especially amongst younger people. Now, as a pediatric surgeon, more and more, we're diagnosing kids in their early teens with type 2 diabetes. In their early teens. Remember, these are people that were diagnosed um, 10 years before. So if you're 43, you're diagnosed at 33. What about the kids that are diagnosed in their teens? When are they going to have their heart attacks or their strokes? And there's a 12-year difference in males and a 10-year difference in females. It is quite astounding, that difference. So here's what's interesting about this paper. First and foremost, it's published in Cardiology. And the majority of cardiologists and the majority of the general population is focused on one thing. They're focused on lipids and heart disease. They're looking at cholesterol. They're looking at LDL. They're looking at uh, PLA2. They're looking at a, a whole bunch of lipid numbers as markers. And guess what? They can't find any evidence. They cannot find any evidence, statistically significant evidence, evidence that lipids are associated with a cause heart disease. They try all these newfangled things. That they, this group did one did first and foremost an incredible thing. They said, let's ignore lipids. Let's look at blood sugar. Let's look at diabetes. Let's look at insulin resistance. And the money is right there. That's where the problem is. Clear evidence that it's carbohydrates and diabetes, elevated hyperglycemia, chronically elevated blood sugar that is responsible for this, heart, for this heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular death. Not lipids. Not lipids. They did look at lipids, and it was not significant. I'll show you that in a second. So a massive change in thinking. That this is carbohydrate insulin model of cardiovascular disease, not lipid heart model. And the treatment for diabetes is the GLP-1s that treat insulin resistance. Insulin, uh, 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 diabetes medications. So a massive change in thinking and the cardiologists kicking and screaming are going to change their mind. But I made a statement. I made a statement in uh, August of this year in a talk I was giving in Omaha, Nebraska, and I stand by that statement reinforced by this paper. Statins will be obsolete as a treatment for cardiovascular disease within the next decade to maybe 20 years. And the reason for that is because fat, lipids, cholesterol does not cause heart disease. It's sugar and starch. And how long it's going to take the population, how long it's going to take pharma to let go of statins and try to defend and lie to us about statins, that's the change. But papers like this clearly demonstrate the issue is diabetes, hyperglycemia, and sugar, not fat. Now, let's look at another incredible statistic that was kind of just hidden because remember these authors these danish authors and friends of mine david diamond and a few others have corresponded with these authors gary taubes and i have had this discussion and we'll talk about that discussion 
In fact, you know what I'm going to do, folks? I'm going to stop here on this video. Because this sheet of paper over here is incredibly powerful. And I'm going to do this as a two-parter. And I'm going to release the second part in a day or two's time. But I'm going to tape it right now. Stay tuned. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Change your thinking. This reinforces our message against what your doctor may be selling you. But the issue here is carbohydrates, not lipids. And if you can treat your diabetes or treat your hyperglycemia, if you're not diabetic, you're going to radically reduce your cardiovascular risk, not by treating lipids like by statin. The second part will be that evidence that comes from the same paper. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Set up a visit if you want to understand your risk. Text 561-517-0642. Leave a comment, but hit subscribe, hit like if you want to see the next one just suddenly shoot up on your, on your page. If you subscribe, it'll pop up on your phone, on your computer. And if you like this content, throw a buck at us at our PayPal account. It's in the show notes. Till next time, watch the second part.